we have heard the challenges from Cameron and Heather, from both the United States and Australia. And uh, they can talk forever. But the key thing is we need to do something. We need to really execute. And the following session I'm going to hear is Stanford's version, what we are going to do of applying AI machine learning to help energy transition and the climate resilience. And uh, uh, we are very glad under E-Trace leadership of Precall, we launched a program, some of you may heard on Monday uh, or yesterday, called the PPP, Precall Pioneering Project. It's a great partnership between our home organization, Precall, and the Bits and Watts, and with our national lab body of Stanford, SLAC, and with another very famous institute here at Stanford in the human AI. So four organizations working together and uh, found this, uh, the first round of the PPP project. We are also very honored to have a very distinguished scientist join the review panel. One of them, I think some of them are here, like Professor Lin Wall was uh, the review committee and uh, Yi Chui was on the review committee as well. Without further ado, I'd like to invite Arun to present the first project, then Ines will go next. Great. I think this is a, yeah. Well, thank you, um, Liang, for that introduction of the Stanford pre pro, uh, Pioneering Projects. Um, okay, let me see. So I'm really representing a whole team out here, which is led by Ram Rajagopal in Civil Environmental Engineering, and uh, then myself, then we have Ines, uh, co-PI, as well as Andrew Ng in computer science. Um, oh, I've got the wrong one, okay. <laughs> um, Chad is a postdoc, and then we have Emmanuel out here, um, Rob Buechler, Natalie Diaz, Tao San, and Zicheng Wang, who's gonna be a speaker again later on. And this is in partnership with Google. We have Guha um, out here in Data Commons, and we're gonna say a little bit about that and then um, Jangi Amjad, who is in Goha's team in, in Google. And this is, as was mentioned, sp sponsored by Stanford Precourt Pioneering Project. And, and thank you, E, for starting that whole initiative. Um, uh, Zi Cheng has a Stanford Graduate Fellowship. This is uh, partly funded by the Department of Energy. Um, and then, of course, Google uh, with support for Natalie. And then Emmanuel has support from a fellowship from Chevron. So what are we trying to do? This is, you know, climate change, I don't have to spend too much time on this. Climate change is happening and it's here. There are lots of data that shows that the extreme events are, are, are really causing havoc. And as I mentioned earlier, the reason when I came out of the transition team in January 28, 2021, I was kind of exposed to all kinds of issues with environmental justice. And, we we got to do something about it. And, and there's a tool called EJ Screen, Environmental Justice Screen, and in the government, which is EPA uses that, but it is used for looking at pollutants around you know, um, refineries and things like that to see what is the ozone level, what is the other toxic you know, VOC levels, et cetera. And they come up with demographic to show, show where the hotspots are. But there is nothing on climate, on climate extremes. And while we talk about the global average temperature rise going up to 1.2 degrees, or now we're trying to keep it below 2 degrees, um, it is not the average. It is the extreme that really matters. It's like putting in your head in the freezer and your foot in the oven, and you're saying your average is fine, but you're killed, right? So it is the extreme that really matters. And it is a distribution, and the tail of the distribution is critical. So while these are, and you can see it manifested in some of the events that happen, and suddenly we say, okay, we got to do something about it. So what, what can we do? This is a classic example of what happened in Texas Freeze, where the, the, the jet stream, when you have global warming, the, the jet stream becomes unstable. And sometimes in the winter, the jet stream comes down, and you know these are what are called Rossby waves, and you get a, you know, a freeze, 
and these are, we call it polar vortex. Uh, well, why is happening in the United States? Well, this happened, there was another heat wave somewhere else in the world because these are unstable, and there are waves that are created. So this is what happened, and the, uh, the demand went up like crazy to about 69 gigawatts, and there was not, and this is Texas, and the grid uh, is, you know, it's managed, it's ERCOT territory, there are not too many tie lines, there are few, but there were not enough capacity to provide the electricity. And not only that, it was like a triple whammy. There was also the fact that some of the generation were not winterized. I heard, I learned a new word, winterized. And they were not winterized, and even those turbines can run in North Dakota, they were not running out there, wind turbines. A nuclear plant got offline, and it was chaos. And now it's a market system, it's a deregulated market system. Market system is great when supply and demand match up, but when the supply drops and the demand goes, there is no market. And so these are situations that I think we're gonna face more and more. But nevertheless, there, were, there, were, there was trouble. And this is just Houston, and when you click on it, you know, there were this a power outages going on, and one has to ask the question, how were the power outages decided? That this community is gonna, not get power and that community is going to get power, there was no basis for that, right? And so you, now you see issues of equity and environmental justice showing up in decisions being made kind of randomly. And this was you know, going around all of Texas. And it's not, I mean, we, don't, we can't blame them because they were not, it was not in their you know, realm of possibilities that to consider that while making the decision. And now, hopefully, it'll come back to, this, uh, come back to the decision-making process. So as a result of that, it was so timely that coming out of the, um, this, uh, you know, the whole transition team, a few of us have found out a few things, and we said that, OK, uh, we should write um, an op-ed about it. So this is an op-ed that a few of us co-authored. How can we better predict weather catastrophes? And this came out February 25th, 2021, right after the thing. And our first line out here was, we are playing Russian roulette with extreme climate events. Okay? That's the, you know, that was that what set up the whole stage. And this is, where, let me just you know, introduce our co-authors. Dave Crisp is the head of the Carbon Observatory uh, Satellite System in NASA. And Abhishek Chatterjee is a modeler in NASA who take the data and try to predict things. And Bill Collins is one of the most well-known climate scientists um, in Berkeley LBL. And the reason we wrote this is the, is the following, that while we have climate predictions, which are 20, 30, 40 years downstream ahead, and they, they predict the average, the weather community, as you know, can only predict about 10 days, maybe 14 if you're lucky, but 10 days. That's why on your, in your phone, uh, you get the weather forecast maximum 10 days. You cannot forecast more. So the climate community, climate modeling community, and the weather modeling community have not quite connected to predict climate-induced weather extremes. And of course, nature doesn't care which community. They, they, climate is inducing weather extremes. So that's the dilemma that we're facing. And there are some work that is going on in sub-seasonal modeling, but it's too little. And we kind of highlighted this and also highlighted the fact that our satellite system that produces the data on CO2 temperature, it's woefully inadequate. And I thought in this transition that, oh, we're gonna put some dollars and budgets and all that. There must be a constellation of satellite measuring you know, climate-related and environment-related things and measuring data in real time. We're putting in a database and it's widely available. Nothing of that sort is there. There's only two satellites that, ca that NASA has that measure CO2, and they are beyond the life expectancy. There were no plans to renew them. And, and you know, they measure the Earth's surface 1% per month. Okay? So that's where we are. So that, of course, highlights the lack of data. Hopefully that can be fixed. The OSTP has now taken a, thankfully, Sally Benson is there to take this up and actually push this along so that we can get more data on climate event prediction. I'm just setting the stage for what we're trying to do. This is what we're doing is still work in progress. Um, 
So this is, I learned this from my students, how to look at things. Climate threat, these are climate-induced extreme events, multiplied by vulnerability is climate risk. Okay, it's very simple. And so what do we, now we can break up the problem a little bit. First is to find climate threat, that is climate-induced extreme weather prediction. Can we do that in a way that has not been done before? The vulnerability is about population. Climate threat is not enough. You've got to look at the demographic of the population, where they're living, what is the age group, et cetera, and the infrastructure. So if you have adequate infrastructure, you're fine. You know, maybe, yeah, there's a heat wave going on, but your air conditioning, the substation is fine. There's enough capacity out there. You're okay. You can live through that. But when you have an event like 120 degrees in British Columbia, they don't have air conditioners out there. In Seattle, et cetera, they don't have air conditioners. And if you try to put air conditions quickly, the capacity of the substation mod may be inadequate. And so that's infrastructure part is as important to be able to get through these climate threats. And of course, if you, if you take both into account, you get hotspot maps. And I'll show you one of the hotspot maps that Zicheng has, been, has, has developed. The vulnerability, so now if you know what the vulnerability is, you can actually do reduction measures for the vulnerability that, that can address the resilience and adaptation of communities. And we went into this thinking that there's a lot of work going on in mitigation, as it should be. But the issue of adaptation and resilience, should we reach two degrees? Should we reach two and a half degrees, which could happen? In fact, it's probably, you know, we have to look at those risks and see if we can mitigate them. So the, the adaptation re resilience, we are trying to elevate that issue as much as mitigation. Okay, so very quickly, the, there are this data, this IPCC models, CMIP-6. There is modeling from deep learning techniques that I'll briefly talk about and adaptation risk aware. I won't, I, I won't go into the details. This, the, there is dry bulb temperature and, and humidity. The both are important. If you're trying to do cooling, it's the combination of the two because the amount of load for humidity is equal or more than just the cooling part because you, you want to dehumidify. The patterns of magnitude of heating and cooling will change the demand for electricity. And so this is going to be very important. And then changing extremes may impact the, the frequency and duration of power outages, which will impact more, some areas more than others. So we've got to figure that out. And of course, who will bear the brunt of a one in, in a hundred year event that is happening now in once in 10 years, once, once in 20 years or so? Who is going to, so these are now equity issues that come into the picture as well. If you haven't read this book, I would strongly urge you to do. This is a book in fiction called The Ministry for the Future by Stan Robinson, and I happened to get to know him and interviewed him on a few things on Stanford campus. It's, the book starts off with a heat and humidity wave in India where the wet bulb temperature exceeds 35 degrees Celsius. For those of you who are not familiar, when the wet bulb temperature, this is a combination of temperature and humidity, when the wet bulb temperature exceeds 35 degrees Celsius, people die. Humans cannot survive. Okay? I mean, this is, this is just biology. Humans don't survive when the wet bulb temperature exceeds 35 degrees Celsius. And he starts off a fiction novel, somehow too close to home, frankly, of what, you know, this heat wave, humidity wave, and then what, does, what do countries do when 20 million people die? And so this is how it starts. And so we kind of said that, let's find this out. Where are the likelihood of wet bulb temperature exceeding 35 degrees Celsius in the future? So we, I'm going to talk about that. So how do we approach this? This is the work of Emmanuel and Rob uh, with help from others. This is, you know, you can do predictive modeling of the models. And as some of you know, when you try to model weather with Navier-Stokes equation and all that, beyond a certain point, you really cannot predict. It's a 10 days. So how are you going to do like 10 years ahead where the climate gives you the average and then you got to do the Navier-Stokes to find other extremes? You cannot. So we, we took the approach because we don't understand all the details of the physics. We took the approach of machine learning. And this is 
what is called generative adverse modeling, GANS um, techniques, to find out what is very important is not the peak of the, the shape of the distribution, but the tail of the distribution. And, and that is a long tail. It's not a Gaussian. It's a long tail. And it is the accuracy of the prediction of the tail that's going to be very important. So this is still work in progress in trying to find out what is the energy climate risk map using this technique. And this is a prediction of you know, a 100-year event where it's likely to happen um, in, 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 the, in the United States. And as you can see, Texas shows up brightly out here. And there are other regions that are above. And the, 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 y, the, the axis, the color axis out here, is the wet bulb temperature 35 degrees, and that's 42.5 degrees. This is a once in a 100-year event. This is now the, the CMIP-6 approach. This is a slightly different approach using the IPCC models to predict the wet bulb temperatures across the world. And this is the work of Natalie out here and with Jahangir and others at Google to look at where the likelihood of wet bulb temperature exceeding 35 degrees. And by the way, I said 35 degrees, people don't survive beyond 35. 30 to 35 is pretty bad. There, there are vulnerable populations who are elderly populations or young population who may not survive if you don't have the air conditioning or the other adequate measures. So 30 to 35, 25 to 30, we have to look at all of them, not just 35. And this is a prediction in Mexico uh, by Natalie and, and her team looking at the probability of when you're going to exceed a certain degree Celsius. So the bottom one is 35 degrees in a region in Mexico. And by 2060 or so, you, are, you will likely exceed 35 degrees wet bulb temperature. But you can also see the red line on top is the 34 degrees, then 32, 33, 32. And the chances of exceeding 30 degrees wet bulb temperature is you know, 100% in that region of Mexico. This is pretty bad. And, so, um, and you can now see the other parts of the world, you can find yourself wherever you're from. If you're international, you can see in places in the Amazonian forest area. In Africa, this is 2050. In India, um, in a Chennai, someone was telling me about Chennai. Chennai is pretty, India has a heat wave going on right now. And these are heat and humidity waves that are, that are likely to happen. The risk of this happening are pretty high. And, and so, this is, you know, you know, if you ask the question again, the, the, fa the, the lack of modeling, where is the next heat wave going to happen? This year, we have no idea. Okay? So uh, again, um, this is the, the, uh, the electricity consumption because of this extreme. I'm going to quickly go through this. This is Tao and Chad's work of the percentage increase in demand. Um, and then again, coming back to that, the vulnerability. Let me show you one example of this. This is work done by uh, Zi Cheng. We have an, an algorithm called Deep Grid. And what, what Zi Cheng has done is to look at Street View, combination with satellite imagery, and the algorithm then looks at Street View to figure out where the distribution network is. And he has mapped it out. He's used, I think, uh, San Carlos as your uh, ground truth, right, if, if I remember right. And now he can map out the distribution network, not just out here, but anyway, including in Africa has done this, and very importantly found out, he can map out where the undergrounding of the wire is. Some, in some regions, the wire is underground. Very important. Why? Because of fire risk. The fire risk is much lower if the wires are underground than if it's overground. Okay, so he has now figured this out, and we are writing the, this paper right now of, of the deep grid on trying to figure out where the distribution network is, which is sometimes, oftentimes, the more vulnerable than the transmission system. And so as a, as a result of that, what he's found was the, on the vertical axis out here is the undergrounding rate. You know, what, what fraction of the, of the mileage is underground? And what you find, it is highly correlated with median household income locally. It has nothing to do with fire risk, okay? And that's why, how decisions got made in California. So this is now in the PG&E region. I, I don't know if the PG&E person, Heather, is still around. So this is in the PG&E region where you find both 
the fire risk you overlay on top the map of the fire, wildfire risk, as well as overground or underground, and then you find hotspots of where this is likely to happen, and it is overground. This is a tool we would like others to use in mapping out, and what Zi Cheng has done is not just for PG&E, but the Southern California Edison, all of California as well, to find out where the risks are. And then we looked into the policy, and what it turns out that the policy of where the decisions are made for undergrounding has nothing to do with wildfire risk. That's the California policy right now. And so this needs to go to the Utility Commission to see if that could be changed in the future because there's, there's a cost issue as well. Um, this is, Zi Cheng is gonna talk about it. I'm gonna very quickly talk about this. This is an algorithm that he wrote and he and Jafan, another student, called Deep Solar to use satellite imagery to find out where the solar panels are and now we have the largest database of the GPS location and size of pretty much every solar panel in the United States. And this is now being used in other parts of the world. And this is the house, the rooftop solar is highly correlated with household income, as one would expect. The question one asked, we asked, is what about commercial solar? Because rooftop solar, yeah, you can make a decision, but if the commercial solar is also proportional to household income, then there's a real inequity issue. And it turns out that it is not as correlated with household income. Why commercial and why no, not utility scale? With the utility scale, you just throw it in the grid and you kind of lose the color of electricity out there. But for commercial solar, if it is behind the substation meter, then frankly, you could use locally. And it turns out that it is not correlated with family income. So there is, if you really want to address inequity, maybe one should be going for commercial solar. Um, and he's going to talk more about this. I'm going to, this is kind of an architecture of how we're thinking about looking at, you know, how does one build a decarbonized energy system that serves all the people, not just, you know, some communities, in, and is resilient to climate change in the extreme. And uh, these are more maps. We are also developing an algorithm called Deep EJ. And this is the combination of environmental justice issues, communities, as well as the climate risk and the infrastructure all combined. And very importantly, we are putting this all in data commons that Guha is gonna talk about later on. And that's a platform, a open source platform that Google has developed and to really enable others then to use the data and use the data to produce more data, more interesting data out of it. And he's gonna talk about it later. Um, next steps, um, this is as you, you build extreme climate event impact maps for policymakers, researchers and industry based on open methodology. Um, we put all our algorithms on GitHub and all the data into data commons so that others can use. Um, model coupled infrastructure, this is very important. We're only looking at electricity, but as we found in Texas, it's not just one infrastructure. It is gas, electricity, transportation all together. Because at the end of the day, it is the service, the human services that matters. It's not just the electricity system, the service matters, and that's a combination of all. And if electricity goes and you have gas, at least you have heating then. But if you don't have gas and electricity, you're really in trouble. Um, then build adaptation response maps with a broader set of technologies. But well, let me stop here, happy to answer questions, and then we'll hand it over to Inez. So, Brun, going back to um, some of the modeling, and this is what I referenced earlier when we were thinking about the importance of us engaging with the disadvantaged and vulnerable communities, because the energy and the other critical infrastructure that was built over the last century didn't take into account the needs of the communities it was often serving. And I, I just want to have a response to what you said about undergrounding and the risk models and the methodology. We have a very robust methodology right now, and I think most people in this room are probably familiar that we have a goal that we're going to underground 10,000 miles of lines in the next decade. And we have spent months talking about what is the right model to decide where we will underground first. And it's that combination of wildfire risk because we're doing this to mitigate wildfire risk. It's also to think about reducing the impact of, of customers to public power uh, shutoff events. And it's also explicitly incorporating equity into this. And so I just wanna make it very clear that there are a lot of built inequities into our system and we are working to address this so that we have a more equitable and resilient system in that future. Fantastic, thank you. See, Cameron asked me to be controversial, <laughs> which is what I was trying to do. <laughs> uh, 
Arun, thank you very much. Andreas Matsakos from Shell. I was in the unfortunate situation to be in Texas on uh, February 14th, 2021. And I appreciate you bringing this up because I think that's something many states can learn from. And I hope California is one, is one of them doing that. And glad to hear. Well, the question I have is, there is to be some intrinsic resistance to interconnect the, the grid networks of different uh, regions in the United States. And I've heard that technically, if we could connect them and we run them properly, we could eliminate some of those shortages and, and emergencies. What is uh, your view about the possibility and the, and the via political viability of doing that? Great question. Um, uh, I agree with you on a more like a U.S. grid approach and a systems approach. The reality is that, um, and Lynn will appreciate this, um, the, there, I know of at least two secretaries of energy who have scars on the back trying to get a single transmission line built. Okay? And I'm trying to save the third secretary of energy with that scar because this is part of the work that the Department of Energy is trying to do with the new infrastructure bill so that we can you know, rapidly get NEPA review and sort of prioritize certain lines and others. And it's really the, the getting together of the environmental reviews, the permitting process, plus if you are doing interstate transmission lines. Interstate is much easier because it's just the state. The interstate transmission line, it is the federal government, FERC is, has responsibility for the interstate. Then you, even though you may have right of way, you will have to consult the states and the local communities. And they all have to line up, the local communities along the transmission line. And the business model for how you compensate for the middle state where the transmission line flies over, and those are still to be determined. Okay, so there are some systemic issues in how we build infrastructure. I'm hoping now that with the infrastructure bill and a lot of money for grid modernization that is going in, and that is one of the focal points for our advisory board for the secretary right now is the working group on grid modernization, trying to streamline and prioritize how to get things done quickly. Because otherwise, it is, if we just leave it to you know, normal thing, it's going to take a much longer than what we want it to be. Lynn? So I'm Lynn Orr from Stanford. So Arun, I, your, your presentation um, struck me that, that, that there's a real opportunity of, uh, here for how we think about very complex networks and systems of very complex systems. And you mentioned the fact that, uh, you know, electricity and gas and water and transportation, they're all linked in, in ways the systems all have different latencies and different time scales for responses. Um, uh, and they're, they're connected in ways that are not always transparent. So th your ability to, to at least use the, these big data sets to look at these raises an another harder question, which is how do all these connect to markets? Because markets, uh, I mean, the, you could view the, the Texas situation as a, uh, an, an assumption that the market made about uh, the, whether you would winterize because there would be high prices for electricity in that period. And that clearly didn't work in, in that example. In California, we have relatively high electricity prices, which is another, uh, uh, it makes it a challenge for the fact that we're gonna to try to electrify so many services. So I'm just, want, I'm, wonder, I'm hoping you can speculate a little bit on what's, what's the role of some combination of data, um, uh, artificial intelligence, sophisticated modeling, and understanding market structure uh, in, in a way to put all this together. That's a great question. Um, so the, the integration of like infrastructure of system of systems, that kind of, you know, and cascading effects. Now in electricity system, we do N minus one, you know, contingency planning. 
well, this is n minus 1 in one, m minus 1 in the other, and, and, and sort of the cascading effects. Um, there is some scholarship, some research that has been done into it, but not enough. It's mostly been done in electricity and information technology because electricity goes, IT goes as well. And then if IT goes, then and other things. So there's a lot of that that has happened. But I think, uh, and I'm not, and maybe there's a lot of work that has happened, but I'm not familiar with the cascading effects of infrastructure going down. And we saw that happen in, in Texas. The issue of markets, so in the electricity, you know, there's the longest market horizon is the capacity market that PGM and all use. And the time horizon is three years. That's it. That's about it. We don't have a market that looks out at 20 year, 30 year, and these climate events are about that time scale. And so I think the market structures either need to be modified with a futures market, which has climate risk introduced in it, or we have to solve some things with market and some things without market. And in that combination, we have to get it right. So it's, we have to, so I don't have a clear answer for whether markets can solve this. And this is, by the way, the same thing happened in nuclear energy, where today's markets are not enough for nuclear, but nuclear assets are there for 60, 70, 80 years now. And so there's a, the infrastructure time scale versus market time scale, there's a mismatch. And we have to figure this out. Okay, I think I've exceeded the time. Sorry about that. So this, this project is called Mesmerize, and if you're wondering what it means, because in the agenda we actually just included Mesmerize, this is a project that focuses on macro energy system uh, model for, with equity, realism, and insight in zero emissions. So the overall goal of the project, as I'll outline, is really to have an holistic view on the changes that we need in our energy system all the way from the engineering and market base to decisions. Here is the vision and the team. So the team is composed by myself, Ram, um, uh, Professor Adam Brandt, and uh, Sally Benson, John Wyant, and uh, Jack DeShallander, uh, joining also the team, and three students right now and, and, and growing, John Uster, Niels uh, de Labomel, and Drew Suri. And the vision that we we're proposing is really how can we accelerate uh, the deployment of effective and equ equitable energy solutions uh, for climate change mitigation and still under that umbrella by providing reliable information to decision makers uh, about the implications of different types of pathways, including their costs, benefits, and potential and intended consequences and having a broader view than just uh, climate change, including also implications in terms of air quality and distributional effects. So the key large question is really what are uh, realistic and implementable pathways for sustainable and deeply decarbonized energy system, and how can we make those decisions by including also features uh, from real policies, so that we're actually making those uh, in the context of real world constraints and opportunities in light of people's decisions and behaviors and accounting for environmental justice. So uh, Arun showed a, an opinion piece and so I just changed my slides a few seconds ago to show another one that, <laughs> that came out, so keep, keeping on learning, on uh, an opinion piece that a few of us did on things to worry about and things that we shouldn't be wasting time on regarding climate debates. And so here we really outlined the issues on some directions that are clear on the type of deployment that we need for the power sector and uh, in increasing the size of renewables and storage and other things that um, we may not need as much time wasted uh, right now in terms of what is 100% renewable energy system look like. What we need instead is try to accommodate the path as we're getting to increase levels of renewables and ensuring that we have resilient systems. So I won't spend more time on this opinion piece, but I'll welcome everyone. This was also on the New York Times. 
So as goals for this uh, project, uh, we do propose to overall create an ecosystem of uh, both people and policy-centered uh, computational hub for Stanford, looking at energy and climate change mitigation solutions. Um, another goal is really to make this as, so as uh, to inform policy and find mechanisms to do so, uh, both at the national level and international level. The other goal is to develop modeling capa uh, capabilities uh, by both uh, developing and supporting interdisciplinary simulation and optimization modeling platforms. Uh, you'll see some of those from the students on what is going on already right now in the first year of, of the project. Um, to identify effective technological, financial, and equitable solutions. And finally, also this goal of providing resources to others. As the team was developing the ideas for this project, one of the things that became apparent is that folks around Stanford are already doing a lot. So there are a lot of tools and data and models that uh, can be useful for such decisions and that can be even more powerful if coupled together. And often research teams weren't aware of the efforts that uh, we're doing. And so highlighting uh, that and understanding where there are opportunities for collaboration became uh, also an important goal of the project. Just to give you an example, in EV50, we have uh, students looking at characterizing uh, the future patterns of vehicle charging uh, in California. Whereas at the same time, in other groups, we had the characterization of marginal uh, emissions factors and damage factors from climate and from air pollution at a very detailed level. So you see where this goes. Combining those two pieces of information can actually be a very powerful uh, policy vote for climate and environmental uh, purposes on when to uh, charge the cars and what sorts of nudges on policies can be uh, pursued. Uh, and finally, also to in, uh, induce collaboration across the research team. Uh, these types of challenges are interdisciplinary by nature, and no one research team can do it alone. We really need uh, really a village with different perspectives, all the way from engineering to social sciences. Um, so to move towards a decarbonized sustainable energy system, but this is really the most uh, pressing issue of our generation. And it is, first and foremost, an energy problem. And so this begs the question of what sorts of energy systems models do we have and what sorts of energy models do we need to inform these different types of decisions? And my own take is that there is no sort of holy grail model that will address all the different questions. We'll need different types of modeling strategies depending on the decision that we're trying to formulate. But those uh, um, energy models can go from uh, fairly um, static to quite dynamic and with more or less insight on agents' behavior. So all the way through understanding just technology models. So ICM is one of those examples on um, just looking at the performance of a power plant with and without CCS and the emissions implications for that. You can move forward on life cycle analysis, which increases the scope potentially to include upstream emissions and not only site-related emissions. But life cycle analysis has also traditionally been fairly static over time and not accounting for major changes that may occur in energy systems. You can think about bottom-up uh, technology integration uh, models, such as the capacity expansion and operations models, which are very useful to guide some of the planning decisions, but often miss how the agents actually make the decisions and behave. And lastly, the family of models, like the CG models, this computational general equilibrium models, that explicitly may include price and income and substitution elasticities across sectors of the economy. So they provide more of that um, um, agent-specific uh, behavior and characterization. But they are computationally really hard to run and to calibrate across all different sectors of the economy. 
most of the work that was done today um, in the groups at Stanford was uh, based on a central planner optimization perspective. And that's not how the real world decisions are made. If you think about this in the context of climate change, most of the models in academia have this sort of formulation. This is an example from uh, the DICE model, but the way to plan what the optimal emissions reductions ought to be are a function of a utility function, and the consumption is used as a proxy for utility over time. So you see the function including consumption over time, uh, the population, and then assumptions about the pure rates of social time uh, preference. This really misses the point that we are making different types of decisions and investments that are not necessarily geared to a central decision maker maximizing utility for all and based only on consumption. It also misses a very important distributional effects that may occur. Some of those are contemplating on the, contemplated on the assumptions uh, that are made on the discount rate, but not all. Um, in addition to uh, that uh, portion of the climate change pressing issue, the current energy systems rely uh, on fossil fuels, and with that, we have also implications in terms of air pollutants, which lead to premature mortality. Indeed, fine particulate matter, PM2.5, is the single largest environmental health risk. It is responsible for about 5 million premature deaths globally, annually. And uh, PM2.5 is associated with increased mortality rates uh, from different types of health consequences as shown here. Now, when we talk about air pollution and PM, just one of the things that is important to refer is that we have emissions from primary PM that arise from tailpipes and a little bit from the stacks of coal power plants. But the vast majority of the PM2.5 health damages comes actually from the secondary formation of PM2.5 due to emissions of SO2 and NOx. Those will react with ammonia in the atmosphere and creating that increased concentration of secondary PM2.5. Why do I bring this up? Well, in the, both the literature and in the actual policy design, climate change and air pollution have both been treated quite separately, so we have uh, climate mitigation goals and we may have uh, air quality standards, uh, but they haven't been looked at together in terms of what are the optimal strategies for your fleet or for the transportation sector. When you account for those two externalities, the uh, consequences and damages from climate change, as well as the premature mortality from air pollution, uh, furthermore, whereas uh, CO2 and methane will be like global pollutants with global dispersion, and in the case of CO2 with a, a very long-lasting lifetime in the atmosphere, uh, when we're talking about air pollution from PM2.5, the effects are actually very localized. The premature mortality will be dependent on where the emissions occur, and so we are not all breathing the same air we have tremendously different concentrations of PM2.5 across the US and across the globe. Let's just see at what that implies in terms of environmental justice. In the vertical axis, I'm showing premature mortality uh, per 100,000 people associated with power plants operations in the United States. So what you don't see in here is underlying uh, uh, this modeling. Um, we compute the change in emissions at every single power plant in the US, the dispersion and reaction of pollutants in the atmosphere, and then couple that with census level data to understand who is exposed to that pollution. And so we see that on average across the United States, uh, we have a, a premature uh, mortality that is around uh, 5.3 for the average uh, American per 100,000 people. And we also see somehow unsurprisingly that as uh, folks are uh, in higher income segments, tend, they tend to live in places where the air quality is better. So we see a slight decline uh, along that line. Now with what we also see is that uh, black African American 
across all income segments are more exposed and face more with the damages from air pollution than other segments of the population. So what I'm showing here is the, um, the, the, the size of those bubbles is just the population size. And on the vertical axis, you see the um, average premature mortality for that group and at that income level. So as income locations increase, we can see still those effects. So some of this is what's the electricity mix in different locations and where do people live? But we do see that there is an important effect that seems underlying here to take into account as we design policies. This is not only an issue across demographics. Um, it is also an issue that involves states. So though all uh, pollution is more localized uh, for PM 2.5 than uh, CO2, it still travels large distances. So what you see in this map is premature mortality, so annual deaths attributable to um, in each state from emissions that may occur anywhere in the United States from the stack of other power plants. So just calling out that we have states like Pennsylvania, uh, Texas, and Ohio that have very large numbers uh, for the premature uh, mortality regardless of where plants are located. So they are, this is kind of the consequences to the state from having the electricity generation system that we have. But we can decompose this into self damages. Those are the uh, implications for premature mortality that arise from electricity generation between the state boundaries. And a different picture emerges. The numbers are not super visible, but the numbers decrease quite uh, a lot for Pennsylvania and for Ohio, meaning that the self-imposed damages from their electricity generation do not account for the bulk of the consequences that they face between the state boundaries. But here is another picture. This is the damage to others. This is the premature mortality that is imposed in other states from generation between a state uh, uh, border. So here we see that uh, the Pennsylvania and Ohio, again, calling out a little bit on those states, are imposing an enormous damage in other states, not within their state boundaries. And finally, the net effects, and I'll call out just New York over here, which has a, a very small contribution in terms of premature mortality due to, to the electricity generation in the state. But it is the state that uh, suffers the largest net consequences in terms of premature mortality. So this motivates the need to bring uh, climate change and air pollution together as we think about all of those issues and in the context of policies. I mentioned that climate change and air pollution have been treated uh, mostly uh, separately. One of the things that we did, and this is still not ideal, given that it is in an optimization framework, is to look at a specific policy that aims at reducing CO2 by 30% from, from the baseline across the United States. So we're just meeting a 30% reduction overall. And then the question we ask is, what's the cheapest way to get there? If we only account for this climate goal and track separately what happens to air quality and consequences for premature mortality versus looking at the two things together. And by that, I mean explicitly optimize the plants that are being retired and replaced based on the consequences, the dollar value of imposed damages from climate change and air pollution. And uh, the three sets of scenarios, easier in map and AP3, uh, you can disregard the focus of attention to that. Those are three different air uh, quality models. The C stands for thinking just about the climate policy, and let's see what happens to the health consequences from um, air pollution. And the H plus C means that we have an explicit objective function that looks at health damages plus climate damages. So a couple of good news. The diamonds represent the net effects, and all across, uh, as a societal output, we would be better off, so there will be net benefits when we incorporate the consequences for climate change and air pollution to make 
the transitions to a 30% carbon reduction. And that's true across all scenarios. But more importantly, uh, we see that if we look at health plus uh, climate change damages together, we are uh, setting up a set of solutions that further maximizes the total uh, net benefits associated with, uh, with these decisions to meet the 30% carbon goal. That has very important implications for states. Here is just a map on, uh, with the coal generation across states and underlying that the color code shows the health damages that are incurred with the current system as we have it, as well as what happens when we pursue a climate only policy versus climate plus air pollution explicit policy. And this just highlights that the plants that would be retired would be very different depending on whether we draft a policy one way or the other. So having very impl uh, large implications uh, to the cost of new infrastructure in the state. Um, we could talk more on that, but just moving forward on uh, what have you done, we done on this sort of work and on the type of data that is needed. We're building Mesmerize as to include both um, an energy and climate mitigation solution model that will uh, be a patchwork of several different modules that um, align with the things that I just presented previously and more. Having harmonized data sets that can be used by others as well as data products and the computational and AI toolkit. So that's the goal. And a few more results so far from this first year of operations. So one of the things that I would like to focus on is really what are the costs and emissions reductions from different technologies for the electricity generation fleet? And we pose this problem at the global scale. So I'll just move. So at the uh, at a global scale, the first piece of our homework is can we characterize the emissions from every single power plant across the globe? And so we started parsing out data sets uh, on power plant generation characteristics, as well as emissions outputs. And we show here just an illustr illustration of those with the goal of doing that both for CO2, which uh, we have been moving forward on, as well as other air pollutants. And so here in the vertical axis, um, you see the emissions of CO2 from different power plants. And the horizontal axis, we are showing the age of the power plant, since we also have that information. And we show for three regions that uh, contribute a lot to the uh, emissions, China, India, and uh, the United States, as well as all the other. The first panel shows the coal-related emissions, second one, gas and oil, and please note that the vertical axis is changing in terms of the maximum unit across all of them. We're still pushing uh, on this, but one of the things that we need to have if we want to think about the replacement of those power plants is what are the resources that we can substitute that with? Meaning we would need very detailed capacity factors or output for wind and solar in those same regions, as well as an understanding on whether there's access to transmission. And so uh, Niels, um, one of the other students involved in this project, started digging up all the papers and data sets that assess resource potential for different renewable technologies. And one of the things, that, while the numbers are not super visible or the names of the authors that I'll point out is that for all of those, the orders of magnitude vary by a lot. So really even just at the level of the technical potential globally for these resources, there is still quite a little bit of uncertainty so we're trying to identify what's the best uh, data source for each of those resources to be mapped out for every single country. Here uh, I'm showing the sort of outputs that we aim to have. Uh, for here we already have for the United States. And what you'll see is on the uh, vertical axis, uh, dollars per ton of CO2 abated. And so what we're doing is going for, to every single power plant, fossil fuel based in the US, and trying to identify what's the most cost effective alternative. 
um, in that location. And so on the right, you're, we're illustrating, okay, we're shifting from a coal power plant and retrofitting it with natural gas or coal to wind and so on and so forth. And we set up this model and code so that it's very flexible. We can assume different types of discount rates as we make those decisions. We can make different criteria on whether the plant is replaced with the same county or location or further away and so on and so forth. So the hope is to do this, but globally. Another set of uh, stream of data and the outputs that we're moving forward is that both uh, Jacques Chalander and, and I have been working for the last few years on um, problems of identifying marginal generators uh, and producing tools that have marginal emissions and marginal damage factors by hour for every single balancing area in the United States. While I had done this on just a production level, Jacques took a further step of being able to identify the emissions intensity associated with consumption instead. So defining an algorithm and a tool that allows to attribute emissions in a certain region uh, based on where imports come from. And this is important in interconnected systems. And so uh, maybe not super visible, but you can see in the plot on the right how the emissions intensity is changing uh, as a function of the hour of the day. And uh, Jacques already put this tool available online. It keeps on being updated. And finally, bringing all of this together with the work from Nora, this paper was actually just accepted today. And so though I know that impact may not be uh, just having publications out, it's actually lovely to see that it came through. Uh, which is combining a lot of these notions. So Nora was able to couple the uh, sort of premature mortality analysis that I've showed previously with Jack's work on imports to try to understand what's the premature mortality and CO2 emissions jointly associated with energy consumption rather than production in case we want to start thinking about policies that are more consumption-based rather than production-based. And um, this, this is my final slide, and it was, again, an add-on in the last minute uh, just due to Lynn uh, Orr's question about markets. But this is an example. This is uh, taking this with a degree of caution since we're just looking at this. But what we're showing is a simulation of um, the Alberta ISO market, which has very interesting characteristics since generators can bid portions of their generation at different prices. So they can be the portion of the capacity at zero and another one at 9.99, sort of, sort of distribution, and they have a full say on the distribution of those bids. And so what you're looking at is, uh, and, and those bids are publicly available and downloadable. That provides a great publicly available data set to understand the behavior of those generators. And as well as to compare, how they are bidding versus what economic theory will tell us that would happen in a competitive market where bids would be placed at marginal costs. I won't go into this because we're still looking at the results, but this is gonna be quite interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll end with that. Thank you. So I'm probably over time, but maybe you'll have time for one or two questions, Yuliang. Yeah. Okay, Cameron here, then also uh... um, Congrats, that's really, really interesting work. Um, it's, it's really impressive and it's really important. My, my question is, and I guess it touches what I said to Arun before, and I probably misspoke about being controversial, I meant probably being academic or intellectually courageous. And when you see that work, that's going to be pretty uncomfortable for some people to see. It's going to be quite confronting and I think it's really, really important. So how as you go into this sustainability school, are you going to make sure that you get the impact, you get that information to the right people in a non-partisan way so that you get action taken from the really important work that you do? You've got an accelerator that's going to help technologies get to market and get to scale. How do you do the same thing from a policy point of view? 
So that's a wonderful question, Cameron. And the, so I'll, I'll, I'll provide my own take, not necessarily the one from the sustainability school, given that that's still uh, under uh, development. But these this problems really uh, are only as interesting as we get to provide the information to actual decision makers. At the same time, we're not in the business of doing advocacy one way or another, right? So we want to stop, uh, or at least I want to stop short of, of, of doing that. Um, but I, I think we do need to create new mechanisms to be able to brief uh, also uh, policymakers in DC, in the international setting too, and definitely in California, about the results and implications so that they can do informed decisions as they think about that. And that will go all the way from uh, really the industry sector as well as regulators. Yeah. I have the other question. Uh, thanks, Inez. I'm really glad that this effort is happening at Stanford because you know equity, the people who are most affected are not likely to be in these kinds of rooms. So thank you for doing that. I'm curious, um, the mesmerized effort what would it take for your work to become sort of the objective, widely accepted standard around the social cost of carbon? And I'll give an example. Under the Biden administration, the federal number for the social cost of carbon is $51 a ton. Under the Trump administration, it was between $1 and $7. Mm -hmm. So that seems completely arbitrary. And you know, any business leaders or investors who've ever run a techno-economic analysis knows that those two numbers will give you widely different solution sets for uh, viable options. So I, I'm curious, you know, as Mesmerize moves forward, how, how, do we, how do we start to have conversations that are not necessarily political driven, but you know, informed by numbers that, that people can agree on? So th that's um, really uh, on in terms of the flux that, that the changes that we see on the value that the social cost of carbon can take depending on the administration and leadership and their takes. And both of them um, justified, if needed, by plausible assumptions, assumptions on what this country to use and assumptions on domestic versus international effects. Um, the models that we're using make use of a social cost of carbon range of assumptions and where we took the um, interagency working group numbers um, pre-Trump administration actually and then keep on updating uh, those to the executive order of reverting back to the old numbers from the Biden administration. But we don't run the integrated assessment models for climate damages. So on your question about, um, first, there is no right number. I think that it's a fool's errand to keep on trying to run those models and coming up with one number that everyone settles on. It's, it's not gonna happen because one, the uncertainty on damages is large. All of this is driven by the discount rate that you assume in the first, in the first place in the assessment. So my take is maybe we can think about this differently. And thinking about uh, it differently is really maybe a more of a cost effectiveness approach, right? So let's assume that we need to get to a certain level and being mostly uh, decarbonized, which in itself, it's gonna be a challenging issue. But uh, instead of playing with those numbers, just trying to identify what are the strategies that make sense all along. And um, not all of it is gonna be cost effective. Uh, obviously, but one of the good things is that at least the cost of some of the technologies are getting um, to decrease enough to keep us busy. I know this is probably not a satisfying answer. That's a very difficult, uh, difficult one, but the other thing would be to just, um, my hope would be that the climate science department here at Stanford will be engaging and working more uh, with the folks in DC and with the EPA that have been producing the models on the social cost of carbon or asking others uh, across academia to run them to support at the very least information on what climate damages will look like. 